Hey guys, Matt here. Welcome to Learn to Discern. I am super excited. As you can see now, I have a special guest with me today. My guest is John Collins. John is an author and is the founder of William Branham Historical Research. John, thank you so much for joining me today. How are you? I'm good. Thank you for having me. Well, thank you so much for making time for me. And uh, maybe before we get started with the interview itself, you can tell a little bit about yourself and about the work you do uh, with your podcast and many different uh, endeavors you have going on. Well, I have a lot going on, if you can't already tell. But I'm, uh, I'm the grandson of the pastor of the Branham Tabernacle in Jeffersonville, Indiana. That's uh, William Branham's home church, headquarters church for the Branhamite or message cult, however you want to call these people, <clears throat> the fall, the cult of personality behind William Branham, and um, I was in it for thirty-seven years, I believe it was, and my family escaped January first of two thousand twelve, and um, that's it, it was quite a roller coaster of an experience leaving. But long story short, is I. Um, had a lot of questions that had no real good answers, so I started digging for those answers, and when I did, oh my gosh, what I found. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it's amazing you uh, you mentioned that. So I have been following along with the, uh, I guess, kind of multiple podcasts you're doing now at, the, at this point, but the main podcast that you do with uh, Charles and listening to some of the, the background and the history with William Branham and his cult, and I mean, it is mind-blowing. I'm not I'm not sure you probably have had somebody say this to you before, but I was talking to my wife and I said, somebody should take this and just make a Hollywood script out of it. But I'm afraid if you presented it to somebody that they would say, this is this is unbelievable. Nobody's going to buy this as a real thing. <laughs> the truth is stranger than fiction. It certainly appears so. And uh, uh, guys, I will put a link down to a lot of the good work, the awesome work that John is doing below. So make sure that you check it out. I listen to his podcasts that come out every week and I have learned so much. And uh, so that actually leads us to what we want to talk about today. Uh, you're probably most well known for your work with William Branham, but you have done a ton of research into early Pentecostalism. And just recently on your YouTube channel, which I'll put a link to that below as well, you started a new series called Satan's Generals. And that might sound really harsh to people until you understand what it's about. And so uh, I'm, I'm sure I know where this name comes from, but can you uh, tell people the, the play on words or really what's <laughs> happening here with that title, Satan's Generals? Well, I, I came across this book that um, was proclaiming William Branham as, quote unquote, one of God's generals. Right. And it, you know, I, I haven't actually read the whole book. I just read the segment on William Branham <clears throat> and some of the some of the others. I've read a little bit of it, but. When you read it, it, it reads like Aesop's fables. And, um, <laughs> yeah. you know, none of it is, you know, there are there is some truth in the book. I'm not going to say it's complete fiction. But right. whenever you take something that is truthful and then you mix fiction with it, what you end up with is fiction. So right. it's very difficult for me not to look at this book and <laughs> just call it Aesop's fables because that's, that's, that's really what it is, right? <clears throat> well, yeah. I discovered this late in the game. I, not just with Pentecostalism, I my studies go really, really deep. I like to study everything. I want to know what, <laughs> I want to peel open the hood of the car and see what kind of engine this thing has in it, right? Mm -hmm. My study that led me to that book actually started with ancient Gnosticism. I was studying the, you know, how the ancient, religions came to be, how they morphed and changed between dynasties of the ancient world. And then Christianity began to spread. And, you know, Christianity is going into these cities and towns around the globe that are that were worshipers of pagan gods. And you had men who maybe had good intentions, but did not quite understand Christianity and so they would take a Christian idea and they would mix a pagan idea whatever mm -hmm. was it, their culture their ancient deity and they would you know like Aesop's fable or the you know the God's generals book they take a little bit of truth and then they mix it with a little bit of fiction and then call it Christianity but what they ended up with wasn't Christianity it was Gnosticism right 
And that led me into, you know, I'm studying it through time all the way, I want to say like the 1600s, 1800s, I can't remember the exact year, Jane Lead. And I found a link between Jane Lead, who was a very weird mystic female cult leader in England. And the, uh, I think it was called the Philadelphia Society. And her writings were found in the writings of Charles Price, who is a name that William Branham mentioned. So that linked all of, <laughs> literally linked Gnosticism, the trail of Gnosticism into Branham's ministry. So I'd never studied Pentecostalism. I began to study it, and I'm finding all of these names and faces that I don't know who they are. So I, you know through what evidence that I can find, I start to see, okay, what is the factual history? Ignore what the Aesop Fables book is telling me about God's generals, what actually happened. And man, it's just so weird. These people, I'm not going to say that they're all Satan's generals. I know the title is very, um, you know, it's very challenging (laughs) just because I I chose that title because of the book. The book title is God's generals. And this clearly is not, God's generous. <clears throat> but I, I, when you take a step back and you look at some of the people, not all of them, but some of them were opportunists who were just trying to build a name for themselves back during a time when anybody could say, I have a revelation by God, and believe me, and they would. In today's mm-hmm. world, <laughs> this would never fly. <laughs> well, you say that I remember I talked to you about potentially doing a, a podcast where we talk about that. And there is there are sometimes are hints of that, but it is definitely way different. The things that people could get away with back then compared to now. I think people have learned to be skeptical about certain you talk about people doing parlor and, and bar tricks and people just being amazed at the things that they would see and were convinced that these things were coming from God. Yeah. Yeah. You know, my um my family had this running joke, and I'm giving away the family secret. Probably should never okay. do this, but we, we had this running joke. Somebody would come over and say, we would say, we know black magic. And they say, what's that? And I'll send my son out, who's, you know, my son, the last time I did this, I want to say he was like seven. I sent him out of the room, and you can pick any object in this room, and he can tell you exactly what it is. Uh-huh. And so... The person would name it, and then we, I would bring the son back in. You know, actually, I'm not going to give the secret because my family <laughs> okay. would kill me. <clears throat> but, you know, here's the seven-year-old who can, no matter what it is, and he, he can be completely outside of the house, and he can tell you exactly what it, whatever object they chose. It's yep. a bar trick, right? It's not, yep. <laughs> it's not real. I don't, I, I don't know if it's the same, but m- my sister and I used to do something similar, but it was uh, pick a card. And when, when the other person came back in the room, they could tell which card you had picked. Yeah, exactly, it, right? It's not magic, right? Yeah, it's a, it's a trick yeah. that we learn. Yeah, so these yeah. people, you know, you're, you're molded into this fictional world of angels and demons and visions and ever-present. I, I don't even know how to put it, like what is written in the Bible, they try to make it hyperactive in today's world and then add all this fictional stuff to it. But they're using a lot of parlor tricks to make it work. And like the prayer cards, for instance, Mm -hmm. we actually believe that this, (laughs) that this was nothing more than to keep people in order in line to go see the faith healer. And then (laughs) whenever they'd get up there and, you know, the faith healer, whoever it was, would say, oh, I, t- I can tell from God that your name is so-and-so and you live at this address. It's exactly what they wrote on the card. Praise God. <laughs> you know, I was right. so duped. I, I'm, I consider myself a smart man, but I believe this, right? Mm-hmm. Well, people who escape this, they're so conditioned to believe that. But more than that, they're conditioned to the mindset where they can believe other similar things. So. Right. One of, the, one of the things I did, one of the support groups that we held in person, I had my son do this, this trick where he walked out of the hotel and everybody picked an object and he, he could tell you exactly what they picked out of the, you know, out of the hotel. And then I explained to them, okay, you've been duped. This is how it works. And this is the kind of tricks that these people are using. And right. it, it's this eye-opening, oh, my gosh, we've been duped, right? <clears throat> mm-hmm. 
Yeah, and you actually listened. So the example you gave about the, the prayer cards, through some of your research, I have read some of the transcripts from William Branham and even listened to the audio of some of his recordings. And there are times where you hear him legitimately telling people, now make sure you line up in order. One, two, three, four. I'm going to call you by number. And, and that might seem like an innocuous detail to an outsider who doesn't know anything about how these things work. But it's like you said, when you've had people write down this information, you need, since you're not actually getting the information from God, you need to make sure that they are lining up in a very specific order so that you don't <laughs> mess up people's information with one another. So it's it's really amazing to, to see those sorts of things. And um, I guess I'm, I'm going to here in a second ask you about some of the specific people that are mentioned in this book, God's Generals, that you're um, you're covering a little bit in your series. But before I do that, I also want to just throw out there something that you and I talked about briefly uh, over the phone uh, a week or two ago is somebody might say, now, why are you focusing in on early Pentecostalism? Uh, couldn't you go to the Baptists or the Lutherans or any any denomination and you'll always find people who are corrupt and, and bad apples? And we would both say, absolutely, you can find <laughs> bad apples in, in every denomination. But the reason that there's a particular focus on this is there is a, a big difference between a denomination or a movement um, that started with Orthodox Christianity, people who had good intentions and some bad people crept in, versus what you're going to see a lot with early Pentecostalism in the United States is that the people who were founding the movement and who brought many of the distinctives to the movement are themselves con artists and crooks and many of them legitimately in trouble with the law and on the run which is why many of them were moving their ministries around from one city to the next i mean would you agree with that assessment john yeah but i actually i take a different position on it <clears throat> i okay. have a lot of people who attack me and they say well why are you attacking this why not the catholic church the catholic church is according to <laughs> this mindset of these people this is a purely evil thing attack it instead and, and I could, right? Like you said, I could attack the Baptist. I do a lot of, um, I do a lot of white supremacy histories in mm -hmm. my studies. And if you study the Baptists, it is equal to the Pentecostal movement in the white supremacy arena. It's, it's pretty weird American history. The Catholic Church extends back even further. But there's two reasons why I don't attack the <laughs> attack the ones that they want me to number one i wasn't part of the catholic church so mm -hmm. i have no real reason to talk about my experience in the said catholic church because i was never in it there's no reason for me to talk about it but more to the point in the mindset of the people that i'm dealing with Unfortunately, the Catholic Church has a little bit higher ground because in the Catholic Church, although it has been covered up and there's some severely dark secrets and sinister history with the Catholic, Catholic Church, of late they have made a, a true effort to try to say, yes, we had some bad things, here's what we did, and now we're moving on, we're trying to correct it. I actually commend the Catholic Church for this. Whenever I mention the same exact type of things that you could attack the Catholic Church for in the Pentecostal churches, they actually deny it, and they try to cover it up. So in essence, right. they're doing exactly what they're condemning the Catholic Church for, and they're wanting me to condemn the Catholic Church, and right. I'm not going to condemn either group. In my opinion, the people that are in it, most of them are just fully unaware. They have no idea. But even worse, they have been manipulated into a level of hyper-control that they will defend it without even critically thinking about it. Right. And so the whole purpose of what I do is not even really to attack, but just to try to open up the mind to critically think about what it is. Because then once you do that, it's a building block that can be applied to any religion, even though I'm focusing on Pentecostal histories, you can apply that to the Catholic Church. You can apply that to the Baptist Church once you learn the standards of how to critically think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good, very good. All right, well, let's start now, John, uh, talking about some of these figures that uh, you have already covered or I'm sure will cover in your series, uh, Satan's Generals. These are people that are mentioned in the book. And I'm going to start with 
a guy who is kind of like the father of this movement in a sort of way. He's really the f- one of the first major uh, characters, and that's John Alexander Dowie. I know you've done a lot of uh, work and research on him. What can you tell us in a, in a nutshell about Dowie? If you're a Marvel fan, this is the kingpin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is the big man. <clears throat> so here's a guy who stole a church, and that's how he started his ministry, right? It's mm-hmm. I, um, <clears throat> I came across him because I didn't know who he was, really, and I was looking at William Branham's birth date, and William Branham, for reasons <laughs> that we've examined thoroughly in our podcast, he purposefully changed his identity. And he gives a different birth year than was his actual birth year and a different name than was mm-hmm. his actual name. And <clears throat> one of the instances that helped me to prove this is he mentioned that when speaking to Dowie's converts, he told them that <laughs> the late Dr. Dowie died on this day and I was born the next day. Yep. So I go back and I look at the date and... Oh my gosh, this is the this is not the date that I was aware of. It appears to be William Branham's actual birth year, so that's kind of interesting. But mm-hmm. for me, I was like, who is this guy? Who is Dowie? And he appears to be the prototype of the faith healer, <laughs> the faith healing movement that sparked in the United States. There were others before him, but none that made an entire empire and built an entire city off of off of right. the work that he did, right? So this is the big guy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you mentioned he he stole a, a church, and I believe that was in Australia, correct? Correct. The, and then he he eventually moves, and uh, something I mentioned already, but you'll see with many of these these guys, not all of them, but many of them, they're moving from either one country to another, or one city, one state. To another and oftentimes it's because they're getting run out of town or they're, they're getting found out so he eventually makes his way to the united states and i know for his uh ministry chicago was a big uh, epicenter or, or, or the place uh, uh where he he really started to to draw people unto himself after it seems like he had some failed attempts elsewhere correct and in chicago <laughs> there's a scene there's one particular scene in chicago that is so funny to me because it reminds me as I'm studying each one of these quote unquote God's generals, the scene itself is so representative of the figures because Mm -hmm. what he did was ingenious. During the, um, what was that, the 1890, I believe it was, 1890 World's Fair in Chicago, he sets up this little shanty of a building right outside of the gate where you have to walk past his place to get into the World's Fair. Yep. But on the front front side of the shanty, he built this big facade that made it look like he had this big church. And then you walk through the facade and you get to this little shanty of a building, right? Mm-hmm. And it's, it's just so ir- ironic because... That's how I view not all, but a lot of these men and women that are part of this movement, they have this wonderful big facade. And then when you open the doors and you look what's inside of it, it's not really anything of significance. And that's how he started his ministry, because people would walk past this and he's <laughs> he's like a circus. Step right up. Step right up. I'll heal your sick right. and afflicted. Right. Mm-hmm. Well, it actually worked. And it just shows the mindset of the people back during that era that people would even enter his door. Right. Right. And you mentioned uh, one of the big draws with Dowie is he's telling people you know, they can come and receive their healing. And so this was a, a big part of many of the uh, Pentecostal leaders. They're, they're claiming that they have uh, supernatural healing abilities. Yet with Dowie, if I'm remembering this correctly, he was setting up these uh, healing homes, as many people did. But uh, maybe you can tell us what was uh, taking place at those healing homes where people could pay to come in and be healed. <laughs> well, he he advertised it as free, right? It's free to come. We'll all heal your sick and afflicted. What he didn't tell you is once you get in there, we're going to want you to sign over your life savings to us, right? <laughs> right. So these people, you know, they, according to the books and the investigation that followed, they were targeting very wealthy people. And if you had no money, you're very unlikely to get into these things once they got started. Now, initially, it was different. People, he, he wanted 
you know, to build a following so he would take anyone. But once it was established, they looked for the wealthy people only. And <clears throat> the people weren't being healed. They were, you know, number one, they're giving away all every bit of their savings and you had to forfeit everything to come into this thing. But then there were many people that were dying and they were whisking people away to the morgue at night so that people during the day didn't see the, the bodies <laughs> exiting this place. Right. Yeah. And, and so terrible that, of course, he, you're not seeing the healings take place there, but also with Dowie, and maybe you can touch on this one as well. I know one of the uh, moments in his career that really uh, did quite a bit of damage to him was when he had a situation arise with his daughter where there would have been an opportunity for faith healing to, to come in. And uh, ultimately, it, it did not play out that way. Right. And while he's telling everybody, <clears throat> physicians are demonic, and you, you weren't allowed in his sect to have any medication of any sort, any physicians. They were inspired by demons, he would say. But then when it's his daughter, he did try to faith heal her, but when he saw that wasn't working, he actually got a physician. And it was one of quite a few instances where he did. Um, he was also noted for secretly having a lot of massages. He had some back pain, so he would have have a masseur come and work on his back, right? And mm -hmm. it again, it's like the facade of the building that we described earlier. This is this is how these people operate. There's a very public face that makes it look spiritual and supernatural and wonderful. But then once you understand what's actually going on, it's just a facade. Right. And it's really sad in the situation with his daughter because uh, she was uh, curling or straight. She was doing something with her hair and they put some alcohol on it and her, her hair, she caught on fire. And so she's in agony and on the brink of death. And as you said, he attempted to heal her. But after telling everybody, you know, don't, don't call the doctor, don't do that. It seems like towards the end, he gave in and did call for medical help. But unfortunately it was, it was too late. And tragically his, his uh, daughter passed away. And uh, th that, um, what sort of impact did that have on his ministry from that point moving forward? I'm certain it had several different impacts, but the biggest noticeable, the most noticeable one, <clears throat> it appeared to impact his psyche because he went mentally insane and to some extent criminally insane. He, you know, the things that he did after that point were highly unethical, if not criminal. And um, he had he had visions of grandeur beyond what any any person that you can imagine would have. He wanted to convert the entire state of New York. You know, mm -hmm. and they uh, they sent people in to invade New York City military style. Right. Mm -hmm. It you know it just turned into further proof that if you try to put up a facade and you yourself are aware that it's a facade it's not going to work whenever there's a real need for the real thing when you have the fake thing. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we could talk about Dowie all day and not run out of interesting things to talk about, but I would like to get some of these other people as well. Although I will throw in because this is going to be a common theme with many of the people we talk about as well, that Dowie also did proclaim himself to be Elijah, the prophet, which um, he will not be the last of those guys that we have a, uh, uh, John, I wanted to transition now to maybe talk about someone who, who came right in the uh, the aftermath, so to speak, of Dowie's ministry, and that's Charles Fox Parham. And this is a man that many people would actually point to and say that he is the the father of modern Pentecostalism. Right. It's interesting because a lot of people deny that. <clears throat> there, are, sure. there are people who say that he is the true father, and they reject William Seymour, and there are others who take the Parms. It's it's just so freaky weird. Some actually take the Dowie side. So there's this weird rift between them. In my research, it appears that all of it is wrong. There, you know, the movement that created the Pentecostalism that we see today, you can't really be focused to one single event in history. There, there were so many different holiness movements that were trying to combine and never really were able to do so. Charles Parham was one who, you know, 
even though he's also credited with being the first one who introduced speaking in tongues, you can also find this being done before this in Frank Sanford's sect, which he, by the way, went and toured and copied and cloned for his own. He also toured right. the Dowie sect, right? Mm-hmm. He was, it's very clear from the newspaper reports that, and the evidence that we have that he was a very much an opportunist. He, <laughs> shortly before founding this thing that became Pentecostalism, he was also a, um, I don't know what you call him, he was one of the ranking members on the board of a company that could produce gold from God through this little elixir that you would drop onto a rock. <laughs> yeah. right? mm-hmm. This is this is not your normal thing, right? This is not what a Christian right. man would sell you, but that's what sure. this guy was doing. You know, it again, I... I <laughs> I look through the ancient histories of the pagan religions and you see some of the weird things that go on there and you think that would never fly in modern times. And then here's Charles Fox Parham. Hey, step right up. I'll give you this elixir and you can turn your gold, <laughs> your rocks into gold. Right. And that kind of goes back to what we were saying earlier. There's also differences between uh, you find a a minister through history and uh, they told a lie to somebody. It's like, well, okay, uh, we're, we're all guilty of that. You don't condone it, but um, that's a little bit different than somebody who's saying, I have this magic elixir that can turn your item into gold <laughs> and, and it's a scam. And they're, they're, yeah. they're constantly doing this time after time. And so um, with, with Parham as well, you mentioned uh, the tongue speaking, that's something he's really well known for, but uh, within his sect, they they kind of had to eventually change the way that they viewed speaking in tongues. They originally said it was one thing, but then they had a pretty uh, prominent failure that uh, forced, it seemed like, many people to change the way they viewed tongues. Yeah. Somewhere, I think I even have a copy of it on my website. It was <laughs> found in the newspapers, but <clears throat> the initial speaking in tongues was like this weird drawing that... Mm-hmm. It was chicken scratch. There was no, there was no tongue to it. It was just. It was supposed to be Mandarin, right? Yeah, it's not even gibberish, man. It's like you know, who, <laughs> yeah. who knows what was going on in their heads? But mm-hmm. you know that that's what they called it. And then, ironically, there were so many civil and criminal lawsuits that were pla- that was plaguing Charles Parham that. I, I strongly suspect he was looking for ways to confuse people and to dodge some of the trouble that he was getting into. And there came a point in time in which they were trying to send missionaries overseas. I think it's China. And they were trying to send them there without any training on how to speak Chinese, believing that the speaking in tongues thing would actually work. And they would go there and none of them could speak it. So they ended up having to come back, right? Well... Mm-hmm. They, you know, this came on the heels of his many lawsuits about uh, one. One in particular was about sodomizing a young man, which you're familiar with. Yeah. But yes. if you read through that trial, the transcript of that trial, it wasn't just that one instance. He was touring in the South, holding youth meetings, and he had got into trouble in several different places with accusations of molesting small male children so it's Mm -hmm. it's kind of freaky weird um his sect also had whenever dowie lost control of zion parham came and started claiming to be the next elijah and so he he then took the the elijah mantle or whatever well Mm -hmm. the group that he established there were killing people and i mean brutally killing people trying to quote unquote heal them so you had civil lawsuits that could emerge from that. That one actually turned into criminal, but Parham was not there when it happened. So he would have been responsible by proxy as it was his sect that was doing it. So you had all of this Mm -hmm. weird thing going on and how do you escape it? Either a, you act like you're crazy, which could be argued or B you just try to confuse the people and leave the country and go try to try to speak Chinese when you can't. It's it's just so weird. Well, his his excuse, John, when you mentioned the uh, the case, the one particular case of sodomy, and you said there were more charges as well. But 
the the reason he gives because he originally confessed and said that he did it but then he mm -hmm. he took back his confession and what excuse did he give for why this may or may not have taken place <laughs> yeah i accidentally did it in my sleep or some some wow. weird excuse man it's yeah i did it but i didn't mean to do it you know <laughs> yeah it's just it's wild when you when you hear that because that is actually i i can't speak i think that's the way you said it like i can't speak to what i may have done in my sleep and yeah Believe it or not, somehow he got off of, of that. But um, is I'm trying to do this off the top of my head. Is is Parham also the uh, the the guy that claimed he knew about the Ark of the Covenant, or yes. am I mixing him up with somebody? Uh, okay, you want to tell us a little bit about that? Well, and it was just another means to try and escape the country, right? He started claiming right. that he he knew where the Ark was and give me money and I'll go find it for you. That's <laughs> that's how it began. <laughs> well, people actually did, and then. He claimed that he was mugged and he lost the money. And what's what's ironic about that is they, there were so many people out to get him for all of the many things that he'd done wrong that you really couldn't prove what happened. Did he steal the money? Did somebody actually mug him and take the money? Did he right. anger the wrong person? I mean, this was not, by Christian standards, this was not a good man. So it's hard to say what actually happened. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Just, I mean, wild to hear some of these things. And again, just pointing back to these are not normal sins or faults that you could even ministers today would have. I mean, this is willful, intentional deceit and uh, just some of the worst things that you can imagine. All right, John, let's keep it moving now. An another guy who was around the same general time period. John G. Lake, who was uh, out on the, the West Coast and was well known for his healing homes as well. <laughs> well, and he worked with Dowie, too. There's there's some research out there, and I can't find their sources. I wish I could, but there's some research out there that suggests that he was one of the doctors that was helping Dowie with his faith healing gimmick. See, Dowie, mm -hmm. would, have, <clears throat> Dowie would have these this suitcase of papers, and he would say, in this other town, I healed these people, and here are some testimonies, and he would give doctors, you know, who testified or whatever apparently lake was one of the either witnesses or doctors i can't remember the exact research and i can't find their source but regardless lake is one of the people who ended up in dowie's commune and the lake is one of the people who joined the paramites he was a parham convert so he was a dowie elijah convert and then a parham elijah convert mm -hmm. he was with the people who at the time that the person was killed in Zion, he was in that sect. And he, you know, it's hard to say what exactly happened because there were multiple deaths, and the timing of his exit coincides with at least one of them, if I remember correctly. But his, his way to escape all of this apparently was to go to South Africa. And mm -hmm. there he began, you know, he, he literally started the apostolic faith missions and the movement that started in Africa. And there is research now from people in Africa who are suddenly waking up to the truth that this is not what I would consider to be a Christian man. This is a guy who did a lot of highly, highly unethical things, which I have some of it documented on the website, but there is this one on on my website on the lake page if you go down to the references there's one particular document from a institution in south africa that i recommend you read it talks about all of the the criminal things that he did and all mm -hmm. of the false claims that he made including wasn't it in south africa that his first wife passed away correct i believe so yeah and I think that that would go again to he's known for the um, the alleged supposed healings that he can do. And yet you, here you have another example of um, a family member, somebody close to him that you would think if you're this great man of God who can heal anyone. I mean, the claims were so bold. I mean, it wasn't like he was just claiming I've healed a couple of people. It's I'm emptying out hospitals and hundreds yeah. of thousands of people are, are being healed. But then your own your own wife. Um, I can't, I can't remember what she died from, but you know, she gets sick or whatever happens and, and you're not able to help her. But once again, uh, John, with John G. Lake, we have a pattern, you said, of immoral sorts of things, including um, he, he advertised a church service 
where he was supposed to have a special guest show up, uh, an uh, Arab mystic faith healer. And uh, <laughs> let's just say it was a bit of a surprise who ended up showing up. Yeah. And again, that's, you know, it goes back to the Gnosticism, right? Anytime you can mention the word mystic to this group of people, they're fascinated by it. Right. Um, I know the instance you're talking about, I'm, I'm actually struggle with names. I can't recall the name at the minute. Was it uh, Abdul Shina, Shinadar? Maybe it's, you know, it's, like the that. whole thing so weird. You know, I grew up with, <clears throat> so William Branham had the same problem, right? He was a faith healer from the early years. Like I think the earliest right. I've pointed is 1936. He had to revise his stage persona such that he later claimed that it was in 1948, I think, is the latest claim when he began his healing ministry, even though his faith healing recordings are 1947. So it's really weird. But his his wife died, um, I think it was 1937-ish, that she died. So he's a faith healer, and his wife just died. And this it's devastating to a faith healer when your wife dies because— I, I, what happened? Why Why is she not healed? Did she not have enough faith? Did you not have enough faith to heal her? And I, there's this meme, I'm sure you've seen it, but the faith healers, they all proclaim that they can do this great thing, but why aren't they going into a hospital and emptying it? Right, right. Absolutely. It's, it's just crazy that you see that uh, time and time again. This is a consistent theme. All right, John, so talking um, about Lake and some of his immoral dealings also um, had one where he was found to be taking money. And I, and I, if I'm remembering correctly, even maybe charges were brought, but at the very least he was investigated for this. I do believe charges were brought where he was found to be taking money fraudulently from people within his own congregation. Right. I, I think it was like a defunct mine or something, but he was selling this mm-hmm. stock that was worthless and he knew that it was worthless at the time. And, <clears throat> you know, I, there are people who get in bad investment schemes and bad business deals, and they're just bad people regardless. Mm-hmm. But all of that aside, he was doing it from within his church, and he was doing it as, as a minister. But even more to the point, when you're in this type of religion and you're under this kind of mind control, you can literally sell them anything that you want. You can – like. You know, we we talked about the gold from God and the Ark of the Covenant, all that weird stuff. You can convince mm-hmm. people of this nonsense, but he used it to his advantage, and it was apparently it was illegal at the time for, to do this, you know, in the state that he was in. Mm-hmm. But I don't believe he ever got convicted, which is problematic. And the people, if you read the newspaper articles, the people of his church tried to defend them even after— they've been duped and he'd taken their money. Mm-hmm. Yeah, just crazy. Um, one thing I want to touch on, because I think this would be a, a theme for many of the people. I, I can't definitively say all of them that we're going to talk about today, but one of the common um, beliefs that was held by many of these men was the belief in British Israelism. And maybe you can, if people have never heard of that, you can describe a little bit what British Israelism is and why that would have uh, been so problematic. I recently published a book, Weaponized Religion from Latter Rain to Colonia Dignidad, kind of giving some of the trail of history behind this, but <clears throat> it was a it was a very political ideology that was mm-hmm. mixed with religion. It the claim was that again before Israel joined came back together in the the state of the nation of Israel that is formed today existed. People did not know where the Jews, right? And so there was this weird false notion that the people of the British Isles were actually the descendants of the 12 tribes of Israel. And so Mm -hmm. those people are the Jews. And it became this weird, I don't even know how you put it, they, they felt somewhat elitists in that they were the ones, they were the chosen ones, right? <clears throat> well, that, w- that was known as British Israelism, and that doctrine came into the United States, and although it had all of the makings of racism, it wasn't really a racist ideology until it entered the United States. But when it came to the United States, you had the 
African American population in the South and many of them slaves. Then it went through the iterations of slavery and the Reconstruction days and all of this. Well, in the South and the United States, people started combining this notion that because the people of the British Isles were white, then maybe the black people have a curse and the Jews are black and we have the blacks in the South. And it over time, it morphed into what became called Christian identity. And it mm-hmm. was the notion that Eve mated with the serpent in the Garden of Eden and produced two bloodlines, one of them white and good, one of them cursed and black and evil. And this just dominated the South, and it led to the civil rights battles in the South. And um, it, it it's a very dark history. But British Israelism was the origin and the foundation that was laid that allowed all of that to develop. Mm-hmm. And that transition uh, kind of leads us into the, the final person that we'll talk about today, the person that you're most well-known for, uh, William Branham, because he also was someone who was heavily involved with British Israelism and Christian identity and taught the the serpent seed and his uh, high breeding doctrine and all these <laughs> different things. Uh, so maybe you can start by talking about with, with Branham, um, you and Charles uh, earlier on in your podcast talked a lot about his connections with white supremacy. Yeah. And in fact, he, he really ties to everybody that we've discussed previously. He was mentored by the second in command of the 1915 Ku Klux Klan, Roy Davis. He was mentored politically by him, but he was mentored in the quote-unquote faith healing from F.F. Bosworth, who was was one of John Alexander Dowie's right-hand men. Also, when Dowie lost control, he became a Paramite, so he was also connected to Charles Parham. And Branham, you know, in the early years, they it was deeply rooted in white supremacy for Branham and also British Israelism. You had Gordon Lindsay, who also was born in John Alexander Dowie's Zion Commune, was a featured speaker at a lot of British Israel conferences. And you had another man by the name of Gerald Burton Winrod, who was known as the Kansas Hitler, the Jayhawk Nazi, who was spreading Nazi ideologies and propaganda, including British Israelism, into the United States. He was working with Davis. You had all of this collaboration in all of these weird racist ideologies mixed with Pentecostalism. And go back to your earlier question, why are you doing this instead of the Catholic Church? Well, this is <laughs> this is the epicenter of everything right. that, you know, everything I grew up with, this is the epicenter of it, and that's, that's why I study it. But this, you know, William Branham, the histories that we were given, I found were completely fictitious. Even his start date of his ministry, right down to his identity, his name, his birth year, they're all fiction. So mm-hmm. when I discovered this, that's why I began to dig deeper into Branham. Mm-hmm. And it might seem innocuous again to somebody who is not really um, knowledgeable about William Branham, about the cult of personality that came about. And so you might hear things like, well, he got his birth date wrong, a big deal. But when you start to recognize that he's saying things like, well, I was born the same day that, or the day after that Dowie died, and I, mm-hmm. I have his mantle, or he also claimed that he was born the day that uh, Israel became a nation, and he's changing his name so that he can have seven letters in each of his, uh, his, his first name, his middle name, his last name, and it's, oh, look at me, I'm special, because seven is the number of completion or perfection or whatever it is. It's, it's all these different things that might not seem like a big deal, but this is something that's pretty common within many of these these con men that they 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 change little details and it's about really puffing themselves up and elevating themselves to be somebody special chosen by god receiving some special mantle so that people will basically listen to what they say and do what they're told 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you forget something, you're not going to give specific details. You're, right. And especially you're not going to give conflicting details. But he, he gave specifics he, right down mm-hmm. to the day. I was born on this day. And he gives two different days of three different years. So there, <laughs> there, there's just no way that it's true. <clears throat> but right. he, William Branham was... He's recognized as the father of the post-World War II healing revival, so it's no insignificant thing. And he's also listed as, <laughs> quote-unquote, one of God's generals. And right. of the men that we've named so far, he's by far the most evil. If you study every single thing about his ministry, the men connected with him, his legacy, what became of it. I mean, this this was a purely evil thing that has been labeled as God's generals, which is, again, why I chose <laughs> the name Satan's generals. Right. Eventually, I'll make it up to his name in, in the series, but this was not a movement by God. No, and, and so we talked a, a second ago about the British Israelism and how it became. See, I, I don't think I knew that it became a racist doctrine once it entered the United States, but even when it got to Branham and he's introducing some of his serpent seed uh, doctrine, it's interesting because you guys have talked on the podcast about how oftentimes in public he wouldn't necessarily say, well, you know, you have the good, you, well, he would say you have the good line and then you have the, the bad line, the serpent's line, but he, yeah. he might not go into the details about what they are, but behind closed doors, he was telling a different story to people. Yeah. And I mean, honestly, if you take a step back and you consider what he said and the implications of what he said, it was so highly racist, but we were brainwashed and manipulated to think it was not. I was, mm-hmm. you know... I hate to say it, I I was fully racist, and I had no idea that I was. We were trained to believe that if I were to marry a person with black skin or vice versa, if my wife was raised and she married a man with black skin, their offspring could not make it into heaven because they were tainted. And according to William Branham, it was, I think, 15 generations of black skin mixed race people that could not make it into heaven. This is truly racist ideology, and you can find every single white supremacist in the 40s, 50s, and 60s saying exactly the same thing. But mm-hmm. <clears throat> what happened? The names that I've mentioned, Gordon Lindsay, he's he's preaching at British Israelism conferences. Roy Davis, he's the one who introduced William Branham to this ideology, this called Serpent Seed. The notion that Eve from the Garden of Eden mated with the serpent and produced Cain. <clears throat> William Branham mentions that he first heard this in Roy Davis's church. Davis is working closely with Gerald Winrod, who I previously mentioned, and Winrod was deeply connected to Amy Simple McPherson's Angelus Temple. He mm-hmm. held speaking events, etc. Also, um, Charles Parham was a teacher of British Israelism. Parham also worked with the Angelus Temple. Out of the Angelus Temple, whether, you know, whether they've changed and reformed or not, I don't know, but historically emerged this notion of called Christian identity. And you branded your identity with your color of skin. And what they did was Combining, see, British Israelism itself isn't racist, but when you combine it with Christian identity, which was built on top of British Israelism, they traced Mm -hmm. the bloodlines through Ham, the son of Noah, and they believe that Ham was the one who fathered the black nations of Africa. So in the Angelus Temple, there was a man who was trained there named Wesley Swift, and Swift popularized this Christian identity doctrine, and he, his movement created the neo Nazis, and a lot of the, he was deeply tied to the terrorist threats, domestic terrorist threats in the '60s, with the white supremacy groups, various white supremacy groups. It's a very, very evil ideology. Well, William Branham took the names, took the words "black" and "Jew" out of it, out of this Christian identity doctrine. And he introduced it as his serpent seed doctrine. But if you study out exactly what he says in that one sermon where he introduced it, he said it followed 
the same exact genealogy through Ham, the son of Noah. So he's saying the same exact thing. Then mm-hmm. he later follows up with a high breeding doctrine, and the high breeding doctrine is the <laughs> the people with black skin, the ones. You know, what I mentioned earlier, the white skin can't marry the people with black skin because you produce this evil bloodline. When you merge those two, you have the full and complete Christian identity doctrine. But mm-hmm. it was covertly introduced. Right, right. And uh, just one of many problems with there are tens of thousands of things I want to ask you about, Brandon. I know we're getting close to wrapping up uh, time. Uh, I wanted to ask you about something that you and uh, Charles talked about on your podcast. Actually, I think did three episodes uh, talking about 1963 and uh, the events surrounding that. Now, this is a big year in uh, William Branham's life. It's where he claims something really, really special uh, happened. Can you just, uh, you could talk about that for hours, but could <laughs> you as succinctly as possible kind of fill us in, uh, somebody who maybe isn't in, in the know, what allegedly happened in 1963 and what was really taking place at that time? Well, there there are actually several. We've only covered a few of them, but the biggest yeah. one I think that you're talking about is this cloud formation. That, Correct. <laughs> you know, I've got examples of this on the website, but there are churches that hang this in the church. They believe that this is the face of Jesus looking down from the heavens, and they believe that it is a actual photograph of seven angels that pierce through the sky. And as you said, <laughs> we furl- we thoroughly debunked this, but <clears throat> William Branham was actually supposed to be hunting in Arizona where this thing occurred. But on the day that this cloud occurred, there was a transsexual prostitute on death row in Houston, Texas. And his, the day of his execution was the same day of this cloud. And the family of this man who was on death row is the same family (laughs) that took the famous halo photograph that you see in all of William Branham's biographies. And uh, which is not a halo, by the way, which is not a halo. I did have the book. I was going to grab it, but I've, I've apparently moved it to my library. The, the photographer, the company that took the, that developed the photograph, the person who took it was aware that the, in fact, they thought it was a faulty camera because there was no light when they took the photograph. I mean, the person who clicked the image saw no light, but the Branham argued that the light struck the lens, so there was an actual light that actually hit the lens. So there's this huge discrepancy, right? Well, the man who knew that this was not anything supernatural and that something something was off, is either stage lighting or his camera was broken, he apparently persuaded William Branham to come fight for this guy, this transsexual who's on death row. And William Branham does. He comes out there and he goes back hunting afterwards and goes back home and doesn't, you know, doesn't even, he's not even aware that this thing occurred. Then whenever he starts preaching, somebody hands him this magazine that's got the cloud photograph and he holds it up. And says, I was there. I was standing right under this when seven of the mightiest angels came down from heaven to visit me and give me the revelation of the seven seals. But, you know, he wasn't even in the state at the time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's really, really crazy. And around that same time in his ministry, um, and this might have to be kind of our our ending point here, because uh, we talked about some of the people earlier and how it was very common for people to proclaim themselves to be Elijah the prophet. I am the Elijah of Malachi 4. Well, William Branham is no exception to that. It was very clear through his teaching. He was constantly talking about uh the Elijah of Malachi 4, and, and all signs were pointing to himself. But later in his life, right around this same time, I mean, the claim actually went from Elijah to to beyond that. And that's also something that you and Charles just covered. Yeah. In fact, we're going a bit deeper with that, <clears throat> because that's tied also to the British Israel theology. Because if you actually oh, wow. read the book of if you actually read the book of Malachi, it, it's not in any way, shape or form talking about the Gentiles. But Mm -hmm. if you believe the false British Israel theology, you can apply this to the Gentiles because he's talking about the the people of the British Isles, which I have descended from, right? So there's this weird connection there. Well, Branham also taught this manifested sons of God theology, which is 
probably the most destructive theology that is in anything that he taught that's false. And it is the notion that in the last days, God would come down in the form of a human being, of a prophet, and the prophet would come come and condemn the world and then usher and usher in the world to the new millennium or whatever. <clears throat> so he saw himself as this. He was the quote unquote manifestation of God. And every single piece of literature, every business entity, every single thing about his ministry mimics this. His the organization that stands today is called Voice of God Recordings. Right. which is the recordings of William Branham. So in the name, right. they're suggesting he's God. Before this, it was spoken word recordings, suggesting that it was the word of God. So every single bit of this was heresy in the greatest form of heretical teaching. Right. It's Yeah, so you actually can listen. In fact, I'm working on a video. If you uh, subscribe to my channel, I'll have it out here pretty soon where you will actually hear William Branham talk about this, the Elijah of the last day is a prophet, but more than a prophet, the Lord Jesus Christ. And remember, he had called himself Elijah the prophet. And he's saying Elijah the prophet is the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, it's pretty clear the implications there. And so, John, we really, truly, I know we, we uh, gave a bunch of information, but we're really just scratching the surface. You do such a tremendous job with all of your research. One more time, can you just share with people how they can find out uh, more about you and more about the work that you're doing. Everything I have is on william-branham.org. If you want the podcast, you'll see in the menus the podcast links. And <clears throat> I've got a video blog, which has a lot of things as well. And our YouTube site, if you click into the video blog, it takes you into the YouTube site. But there I have many different playlists of different categories of research. So you can find all of that, but on the website itself, you can almost type in any name into the search bar that we've discussed, and down towards the bottom of the page, you'll find all the documents, the images, the videos, etc. So hopefully it's easy to find. If not, let me know, and I'll, I'll try to adapt the website to make it easier. But yeah, ev no, it's everything's great. there. Everything's yeah, it's there. great. <clears throat> That's what I've been using myself, so I, I appreciate that. Guys, make sure you go and check out his website, check out his work, his books, uh, subscribe to his podcast. If you love history and want to know more about some of these men, check it out. If you love fantasy, he's actually talking about history, but sometimes you'll think he's talking about fantasy because it, it really is that absurd. So uh, no matter who you are, I think you will greatly enjoy it, so make sure that you check it out. John, thanks again for everything. God bless you. Have a great day. Thanks for having me.